last Tuesday, two days ago, we uh, uh, learned more about in what form nutrients are in the soil. And uh, we stopped by looking at micronutrients and learned something about their uh, occurrence in soil. Um, the next step is how plants actually access nutrients. And that is very much related, of course, to the occurrence of the nutrients. So this, this is a very, very important uh, concept, though the numbers might not be um, accurate for, uh, for all situations. This is a, a situation where corn is cropped on a loamy alfisol. Um, but what is important that, to learn and realize that there are several different ways that nutrients actually can get to a root surface and into the root and up the plant. Uh, and that one possibility is what they call here in the book by Barber, uh, root interception. Uh, that means that the root actually goes to where the nutrients are and, and browses off, so to speak, uh, the nutrients. The other one is mass flow. Um, mass flow would be that the nutrient actually moves with water to the root surface. So when the water is flowing into the root, the nutrient comes with it. And diffusion, um, the third principal way of, of uh, a, a nutrient reaching a root surface is that the water actually doesn't move, but the nutrient diffuses through the water to the root surface. And now if we look at different nutrients here, starting with nitrogen, um, the authors here uh, say that root interception actually plays a very small role, a proportional role for nitrogen uptake, but the bulk of nitrogen is taken up by mass flow, so that the water flows uh, into the root uh, through transpiration um, uh, mass flow, and the nitrogen is flowing with it. Diffusion plays a role, but um, they say here for, for their case study that was only 20% uh, important for total uptake. Uh, phosphorus, very different. Root interception, again, very low, but mass flow, very, very low. Um, so they say that phosphate is not uh, really transported with the water to the roots for surface, but diffusion plays a huge role. Why is that? Now that we know much more about in which form phosphorus is, uh, is uh, present in soil. Why would that be? Why is it diffusion and not mass flow? And nitrogen is mass flow more than diffusion. Helen, help us. Um. Judging from the, the nutrient forms and so, what, what is, what, as what, where is uh, nitrogen present and, and what's a huge uh, pool of phosphorus um, We, we discussed that last week in, 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 uh, um, in relation to leaching, for instance, and we... The solution pool of phosphorus is really small? Yes. So, I guess, it's so small, you could, like, just a little bit taken up would knock it off, you pull it really in a lot, so without just composite, I'm not sure if that's really fast. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, you're, you're on the right track. Come in there. Because it's such a small pool that if you take just a little bit, you're going to knock the equilibrium off a lot, and so it's going to have to, um, more will have to enter the solution. Um, well, you can stick with your first sentence and, and say that there's, for phosphate, there's very little in soil solution because we have so much fixed phosphorus and have a strongly adsorbed phosphate. Um, so there's very little in soil solution. So if water goes into the roots, it's not taking a lot of phosphate with it. Um, whereas for nitrate, we said on, on ammonium, uh, inorganic N, we said there's comparatively a lot in the, in the soil solution. So whenever soil solution moves anywhere, it takes with it a lot of nitrate and ammonium. So that is why, why mass flow is really an important mechanism for nitrogen uptake, but it's not an important mechanism for phosphate uptake. 
Diffusion, diffusion. Um, what's diffusion? Uh, maybe I'm. Uh, how how can we explain diffusion? Uh, you could consider it a little bit that 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 you uh, active for water. Um, so water is flowing into the root because the uh, the plant transpires water. So water is going into the root and with it flows the nutrient. Whereas if there is no water flow and there is, like Tara said, a concentration gradient, but the water is not flowing. Then the nutrient in the water is flowing oh. to the uh, to the location of the smallest uh, concentration, the lowest concentration. So it will flow to the root surface um, without any water flowing. Just the nutrient is 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 moving towards the uh, towards the root surface because there is where active transport um, takes up the phosphate uh, without any water entering the root, um, that, that is a possibility. Uh, so that is why, why f because of the low concentration in the soil solution for phosphate, which is a function of the strong adsorption and the, the, the large amount of fixed phosphate in soil, um, there is not so much phosphate in soil solution that mass flow would be a relevant transport. Uh, diffusion is the relevant transport mechanism. Uh, potassium. Uh, quite similar, actually, to, the, to uh, uh, phosphate, a <clears throat> little bit more mass flow, uh, but in an alfisol, and we'll learn that uh, possibly today, maybe uh, in the next <coughs> session, uh, there is a possibility also for potassium fixation. Uh, that depends very much on the clay mineralogy. Um, it can be also highly leachable, but it can also be um, uh, absorbed very, very strongly. And uh, sulfate has very little... Um, uh, strong absorption in an alfisol, so we wouldn't find a lot of um, diffusion, uh, but a lot of mass flow similar to nitrate. Um, and for calcium and magnesium, uh, there is a lot of mass flow as well, but also root interception that, that the root act actually goes to uh, locations of high calcium concentrations and, and uh, takes it up. Um, we sort of touched upon that a little bit, what are nutrients taking up, and, and um, uh, let's go through that for each nutrient. Nitrogen is preferably taken up as nitrate, um, and that is more of an evolutionary proce uh, process, how that developed, uh, because nit nitrification is very, very rapid in most soils, so we have a prevalence of nitrate in the soil, so the plants actually develop mechanisms to take that up very efficiently. But they have to actually reduce it back to amino acids and amino sugars. So it actually would be energetically more useful for them to, to use ammonium. Um, uh, and some plants actually prefer ammonium over nitrate. But in, in general, uh, nitrate is, is taken up uh, more. Um, organic N uptake is reported. That is sort of uh, or was uh, already a, a hot topic. Um, and it's not easy to, to assess that, but some folks have done that um, and have written high-profile publications out of that. But that's more of academic importance as far as we can see at the moment. Uh, it might, for some lichens, uh, it might be a really important uh, mechanism, but really in, in forests or in agricultural uh, lands, it, it doesn't, at, to our knowledge at the moment, it doesn't seem to be a, a very important uptake mechanism for nitrogen. Phosphorus as phosphate, uh, sulfur as sulfate, <coughs> uh, magnesium, calcium, potassium in mineral form as, as an iron, um, iron as iron two shellates, uh, manga manganese and zinc, um, possibly zinc as, as a zinc oxide, but um, I'm not so certain if, if this is the last word is spoken on that. Um, copper uh, as the AR, um, cation, possibly also as organic complexes, 
and boronum and lyptimum as borate and molybdate. That brings us to the end of, uh, of the boxes for now. So we, if, you, if we go back to our first session uh, where we drew the nutrient cycles and we had all the boxes, all the pools where our nutrients are, and um, all the arrows, so we, we filled the boxes. We know now uh, more or less what's in the boxes. Uh, we also know more or less uh, how large these boxes are, and now we go to the arrows, so the transformation from one pool into the other. Um, and what we will be discussing over the next few sessions is adsorption um, of nutrients, fixation, uh, precipitation of nutrients in soil, mineralization and immobilization, so biological uh, processes, weathering, uh, volatilization, leaching and erosion. And uh, a very important one that we're starting with is adsorption. And that's something that we dwell on a little bit um, because it is really a very, very important process in, in soil that we need to understand fully. Um, there are different types, or there, there are efforts to, to distinguish different types of adsorption to uh, understand best, better the mechanisms of, of adsorption. And uh, to uh, make the learning a bit easier, they're categorized into unspecific and specific adsorption. Um, unspecific adsorption, we'll be talking about van der Waals phase partitioning, electrostatic adsorption, and specific uh, covalent bonding of some nutrients for, for what that, um, that process is um, relevant. Uh, van der Waals and phase partitioning, uh, first, uh, we go through that very rapidly. Van der Waals is a weak short range adsorption, uh, is not very important. Uh, in the absence of other adsorption mechanisms, it might exert some, some effect, but it's generally uh, of more academic importance. Um, so it's, it's basically an adsorption between uh, weak, transient, or permanent dipoles, um, and uh, is, is, in comparison, as I said, to other adsorption mechanisms, not very um, uh, forceful. Phase partitioning can be uh, interesting. Uh, it's, it, it happened or is, is an important mechanism for organic um, of, uh, adsorption of organic uh, compounds. Uh, if we, for instance, look at, um, at PAH um, uh, or PCBs or any of that, uh, we, we might uh, have find some, some uh, phase partitioning. And you can imagine that uh, being somewhat of a mixture of adsorption and absorption, uh, like a uh, an organic is more soluble in another organic than in water. So if you have very hydrophobic, what we call hydrophobic, so they, they hate water, hydrophobic compounds, they probably like to be more in an environment that is also hydrophobic. And uh, a large part of the organic matter is hydrophobic, or also uh, quartz grain surfaces are hydrophobic um, to an extent, then uh, these, these compounds enjoy more being in there. Uh, than, than outside. Um, has anyone, I don't know if chemistry classes still do that, uh, these, these um, uh, extraction of organics with another organic. Um, does anybody do that in these funnels? Yeah. Helen, do you want to explain that, how that works? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what, what do you do there? Mm -hmm. uh, they separate uh, according, well, which one is up on top and which one is on the bottom is a, is a, f a matter of density, you're right. Um, that they're separate at all is more a matter of hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity. Um, but that's right, so you have these interesting looking funnels that are actually closed at the, at the top and you you, for instance, have the problem set that you have an organic pollutant or an organic in, in a water, um, and you want to get that out uh, and, and analyze it. And you can add a hydrophobic or an organic substance, and they will have two phases. You shake it, they mix, they extract the, um, the organic from the water, and then they're separate according to density. Uh, the most likely, yeah, I don't know which one will be on top of the bottom, it depends on the organic. Um, but, uh, but 
that that is, for instance, if if you have ever done that, that helps you maybe understanding what what the mechanism could look like in uh, in phase partitioning. Um, electrostatic adsorption is the third form of adsorption, and that's really the one of the most important ones. Um, and uh, it's usually, as I said here, the bulk of unspecific adsorption. Unspecific meaning that it it is really um, uh, valid for for everything that is uh, charged. It depends on the surface area. It depends on the composition of the soil matrix. It uh, depends on the charge of the atom, the size, the pH, and other ions present in the soil solution. And we'll look at this now in detail. So it depends on a lot of different factors. Uh, so surface area is obviously one. If, if you have a high charge and uh, the nutrient really likes to go to that charge, like a magnetism, um, but there's not a lot of surface where a lot of different nutrients can attach, it doesn't do you a lot of good. Then maybe only one ion can attach and the others um, just stay behind. Uh, but, and you see that all these clay minerals, um, so these are all secondary minerals, uh, kaolinite, elites, vermiculites, mectites, allophane, and then humic acids or humans, have different specific surface area. Uh, kaolinite is known for having very uh, small surface area, and then it goes up elite, vermiculite, and the three layer, what we call three layer, or even these um, uh, uh, allophanes that, that are, are, or immogolites that have, um, are tubes or, or little balls, spheres, uh, that have a huge amount of surface area. Um, mean charge density, however, uh, doesn't really go according to, uh, to this, this surface area. So you have, for instance, in the kaolinite uh, haloicide, you have uh, a relatively high charge density compared to the allophane. But I can already tell you now that the allophane absorbs a lot more of uh, nutrients. So this means that just by mere charge density, what we just said now, that, that there is a lot of charge that can potentially absorb nutrients um, is not the whole story. If you don't have a lot of surface area where these ions can attach, then it doesn't do you any good that you have a lot of charge to keep them. Um, and now the question is, how can that be that these have such a high surface area? And that is mainly a question of uh, inner surfaces. These clay minerals have inner surfaces. And if you look here, um, we have here uh, clay minerals. Uh, this is a kaolinite, and this is a three-layer mineral um, where you have here aluminum and, and silicium, uh, aluminum octaeders and silicium tetraeders, and then you have space in between. And that is actually where, um, where ions can attach as well in these interlayers. So you have, per unit mass, you have a lot more surface area and a lot of that is what they call um, inner surface area. And that's the reason why we have a lot more um, possibility to absorb cations in smectites, vermiculites, than, for instance, in kaolinites. So the type of, um, of uh, clay mineral is really, really important for the amount that can be absorbed. What is the source of this electrostatic absorption? Uh, in clay minerals, it's so-called permanent charge. In oxides and hydroxides, it's mainly called uh, a charge that's called variable charge. Um, and we'll learn something that's called point of zero net charge, um, where at which point uh, on the pH scale the, the um, net charge is actually zero. Soil organic matter has mainly variable charge. Um, and we'll discover in a, in a second how, how that works. Okay, charge of clay minerals. So this permanent charge, how, is that, how does that work? And I actually have uh, a few models here that we could quickly look at. Um, and this here, because I, mean, I, I look at this and immediately see it, what it what, how this is shaped, but it's a, it's a little bit like a hidden picture. If you have never realized how that actually works sterically, you're probably having difficulty seeing that. So this is a 
this is a, called a tetraeder, and uh, um, it has a silicium in the middle usually. So that's what the silicium tetraeder looks like: silicium in the middle and the oxygen here, the balls. So this here sits like that up there, and here's another one that sits with a with a tip to the front, and then another one that sits with a tip to the back, and then there's another ring in the back. Uh, so the set, same down here, um, and another one down here. And in the middle, you see the silicium hanging in this tetraeder. And then we have the octaeders. And in the middle of those, we have an aluminum. And those sit down here, like that, like that. And another one here, and also in here, and in here. And in the middle sits the aluminum. Um, I don't know if you want to look at this or, or uh, if that helps you. You um, might want to just play around with that. Um, now, that alone doesn't give us any charge. If all the aluminum is in the octaeders and all the silicium is in the tetraeders, we have no charge. But what happens now? There might be something that's called a replacement or an isomorphic. Forget about the isomorphic, but replacement of a higher charge by a lower charge cation in the silicium and aluminum octaeda structure. Uh, so if I make them colored now, we have the silicium in its octaeder, as it should be, and it is plus four. If we replace it, uh, with an aluminum that has only plus three, that means we lost one positive charge. So our clay mineral is one negatively charged. And that means it will exert an attraction for cations. And funny enough, the aluminum fits into the silicium tetraeder as well. So um, that's why it's called isomorphic. It, it just seems to sterically fit in there. Uh, although it might prefer the silicium, but sometimes these things happen, so it's replaced. Um, and, and the same can actually happen in the aluminum. Uh, what could be in there? Do you have a suggestion? What? If you kick the aluminum out, and, and the goal is that, well, not the goal, but the outcome is a, a potential net negative charge, what could it be replaced by? Take some wild guesses. Calcium. Uh, calcium is a possibility. It doesn't work so well, but you're right. Calcium is has two plus. Aluminum has three plus. That would actually be one down, being net negative charge. Yeah, others that could be in there. Magnesium, also is also two plus. Would also work, but for whatever reason, it's not that common that it goes in there. Iron, Iron is, for instance. Iron, iron two plus. It, it, iron th exists also as three plus, but iron two plus would go in there as well. Nitrogen. Nitrogen. Hydrogen. Hydrogen. Hydrogen is too small. Wouldn't go really. But manganese could also go in there. Uh, but iron is, I think, one of the standard ones that that you would you would find. Yeah, but but the idea is always the same. You have uh, uh, for the aluminum octaeders, you have a divalent cation replacing the trivalent cation. And that means your one plus down means you have um, uh, one more, one more uh, net negative charge. Um, now I'll try something and uh, confuse you a bit more, hopefully not too much. But this is the same thing, and I'll use that later on. Um, so that's, that's the, the same structure. Uh, here is the silicium inside the, the uh, tetraeder, and here's the um, octaeder aluminum with the, uh, uh, the oxygen on the side. And then you see the hydrogen on the outside here. Um, and what I couldn't do with the other one, I can, I can topple this down so you can actually look inside it. Um, Oops, and you see 
with a little bit of imagination, you see also this ring of uh, silicium here uh, with always the, the, three, um, the three oxygens around it. And that's how they're bonded. And in the back now, you see the aluminum. And we'll pull up that one later on uh, again when we need that. Let me put that back. So now to make this cross disappear, I need to There we go. So this was permanent charge. So there, this replacement would then have always this charge. And always means, um, and we see that a little later, with respect to the pH in the soil. Variable charge, however, um, is not there all the time. Uh, it, it happens, and that can happen with uh, many of these clay minerals, by dissociation of surface OH and OH2 groups. Oops. Um, so these OH groups out here or down here, um, they can lose a proton and then have, um, uh, have a, uh, have a net, net negative charge where a metal ion can absorb to. Um, and obviously that depends largely on the pH of the soil. So here we have permanent charge and variable charge. Um, charges of oxides iron and aluminum oxides, they have no permanent charge. They have only variable charge. Uh, and the same as with the clay minerals before, uh, by dissociation of um, protons from OH2 groups or OH groups. And here comes a very important concept, what, what that all means then. Um, here, for instance, and that's why we call it variable and permanent charge. If you plot the pH here on the x-axis and the surface charge on the y-axis, you will see that you don't have always the same surface charge, but it depends very much on the pH. As the pH goes up, you have more um, negative charge and therefore the soil can absorb more, uh, more cations. If the pH goes down, you have less net negative charge and the, uh, uh, there are fewer, uh, fewer cations that can be absorbed. So that's, that's what this graph says here. Higher pH, the surface charge, um, uh, the surface charge, uh, the CC goes down, it uh, goes up, there's more negative charge. Um, with higher pH, the net positive charge, the anion exchange capacity goes down. And then you subtract one from the other and you get your net charge. Um, let's try that again. Uh, this, this is a really very important concept and, and we, we need to understand that very well. Um, and sometimes these graphs are flipped around, uh, so I always have to be careful what, what, is, uh, what is net negative and net positive charge. So I'll try to explain it with, with the cation and anion exchange. Uh, cation exchange is depicted with these, with these um, uh, round dots. And we see that with decreasing pH, our cation exchange capacity decreases. It's going closer to zero. With lower pH, our anion exchange capacity increases. So we have more opportunities to absorb anions. Conversely, if our pH increases, our cation exchange capacity increases, and our anion exchange capacity is almost zero. So let's try to look at that, of course, since we know that permanent charge and uh, variable charge depends much on the clay mineralogy. This will also very much depend, these dependencies of pH and, and cation and anion exchange capacity will be highly variable uh, depending on the clay mineral. Um, so here we have four different uh, examples of a clay mineral, a haloacid, which is sort of very similar to a kaolinite, um, 
a, a, a smectite, a gibbsite, and an allophane. Um, and here it's a little bit differently done. Uh, we have here cation exchange capacity on the top and anion exchange capacity on the bottom, which means uh, negative charge on the top and positive charge uh, of the surface on the bottom. Um, it's always a, it's, it's a bit confusing maybe at the beginning, um, and, and I also have to watch my language always because, of course, negative charge on the surface means cation exchange capacity. Positive charge on the surface means anion exchange capacity. So you have to, you have to watch what, what you're saying uh, to not confuse that all the time. And, and it's the same for, for me as well. Um, so here the halo side, um, here's the pH down here again. Uh, so we see that there is not a whole lot happening here as a function of pH, not as in the previous picture, but there is a little bit happening. You see that the anion exchange capacity goes up uh, with, with a lower pH, so there's more positive charge on the clay surface, whereas the uh, cation exchange capacity goes a little bit down with lower pH. But it doesn't go to zero. It doesn't disappear completely. So you can see that this clay mineral here has a tiny bit of what we call variable charge, which varies with pH, but a lot of it is permanent charge, which doesn't vary with pH. So this clay mineral has cation exchange capacity even at very low pH. Very similar, by the way, the smectite. And smectites are, are um, clay minerals that we would find around here, for instance, in upstate New York, um, as, uh, but also in, in highlands, in the tropics. Um, but it's not a clay mineral that you would find in humid tropical environments and highly leached soils. Um, you would not find this clay mineral. Now here come two completely different um, clay minerals. Allophane, uh, what, where would you find the allophanes? Does anybody know where you find allophane clay minerals? If you haven't gone into a basic soils class, you, you might not, not necessarily know. But allophanes are, are clay minerals very typical of, um, uh, of uh, volcanic soils. Um, so you would find them on Hawaii, you would find them in the East African <coughs> highlands, on, on Mount Kenya, Mount Elgon, you find, would find them um, in the Andes. Uh, you would find them in Indonesia on, on high mountains, somewhere in volcanic mountains. That's where you find allophanes. <clears throat> um, allophanes, you see that these, the cation exchange capacity really plummets down when the pH goes down. If we decrease the pH, uh, cation exchange capacity goes close to zero. Uh, anion exchange capacity increases dramatically. In there somewhere is, if you subtract one from the other, the product will be zero. And that's what we call the point of zero net charge. That's the point, the pH point, where cation exchange capacity and anion exchange capacity equal out as zero. Where the net where the negative charge and the positive charge are the same and the net charge is zero. And that is obviously a very, very important point. And actually, that is, a, um, that is an important parameter in, in soils, but that applies also a lot to material sciences. Um, any, any filtration, if it's uh, uh, sugar beet um, syrup, or um, any, any industrial process that requires filtering and that goes very often with surfaces that ha and, and the filtration mechanism um, depends on, these, on, on the properties of, for instance, point of zero net charge. So that, that is a concept that's not unique to soils, but that is known to all filtration, water filter purification, everything. You need to know um, the reaction of, the, of your adsorbent um, uh, as dependent on the pH, and that will affect your surface properties and how um, your uh, adsorbates are adsorbed to the surfaces. So you see here, obviously, um, here we never reached that, by the way. Yeah, up here we never reached that point. 
it's always cation exchange capacity that dominates. There's always a net negative charge on the surface. There's always a net cation exchange capacity. Here, at low pH, we obviously have very little cation exchange capacity, but an anion exchange capacity dominates. And 5, 6 is not so low. What, what are typical pH values for, for soils? Uh, Mount Pleasant. Uh, typical values, yeah. So six and a half is a is a sort of the the, the optimum. Or six six and a half is a is a great pH to uh, for for uh, soils to farm on. Uh, Mount Pleasant probably we have rather five four and a half five somewhere around there um, in in tropical soils or here in pot soils somewhere we can have even four um, in KCL maybe three point eight. Um, so in, that wouldn't be an agricultural soil anymore. But a pH of 6, 5 to 6 is not a very low pH. A lot of soils, a lot of agricultural soils have 5 to 6. Uh, that means in this soil we have no cation exchange capacity if, if the soil was only constituted of allophanes. So there would be nothing that holds the, uh, the cations. You fertilize calcium, magnesium, ammonium, whoops, it's gone. Gibbsite, even worse. This is, gypsite is an aluminum oxide, um, and it, um, for instance, you have a lot of gypsite in the, the Amazon, um, in, in many tropical lowlands, uh, gypsite is a dominant clay mineral. And you see here that there's hardly any surface negative charge, meaning cation exchange capacity, only at a very, very high pH, 8. But when do you ever have a pH of 8? probably your, 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 your soil is, is dead by then anyhow because this pH you only reach in which kind of soils? A pH of 8 or 9? What soils would pH have a pH of 8 or 9? Dry lands. Salt affected soils, especially sodium, so what we call solon chuck or solonets. Um, in uh, salt pans in northern Kenya, for instance, uh, Loitikipi Plain. Um, uh, in Australia, uh, we have these salt-affected soils. So um, high, high pH soils, th these are not very good soils. So we can safely assume that in a gypsite, in a pure gypsite soil, we will never have cation exchange capacity because of the gypsite. The gypsite will always, in the entire range of pH that you find normally in agricultural soils, will always have a net positive charge, meaning a net anion exchange capacity. So stupid question of mine, how do you get then any cation retention in the central Amazon if there are only gypsites, for instance? Organic matter. Organic matter. So that's the only hope that we have. And now you see also why we are always trumpeting and say organic matter management is key, especially to highly weathered soils in the tropics. There is nothing else that could retain cations. Nothing else. It would never hold any nutrients. You can fertilize as much calcium as you want, it's gone tomorrow. Because it can't hold it. And so these different mechanisms, variable charge and uh, um, permanent charge, uh, is extremely important to understand um, and the effect of different mineralogy on this. So, so organic matter is, would be the only way uh, that that would work. Uh, and organic matter has actually only variable charge. Yeah? Does that mean you can't lime those soils? Or be because they're in the cation exchange capacity that you can't lime them to change the pH? Um, you, you can... Uh, because the lime dissolves so poorly. Um, so so it, it sort of works because it, it's very uh, weakly dissolved. Um, and um, so that just the dissolution of the, of the lime takes, takes longer than, than the leaching uh, would take it out. Um, so it would work. And supposedly you have always a little bit, tiny bit of organic matter, which helps already a lot. Uh, so organic matter, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, actually, very often in, uh, in these acid soils where you want to raise the pH, um, because as we see, raising the pH, if you have variable charge, can increase the cation exchange capacity. Um, the, 
the problem is not uh, the leaching of the calcium, um, but rather the not leaching of the calcium. Uh, that sounds a bit funky now, but um, very often if you apply uh, lime on the soil surface, it doesn't move very far down. It stays in the wherever you plow, 5, 10 centimeters. Um, and that's very often not enough for the roots to exploit soil volume and, and they experience maybe drought immediately because they can't exploit the subsoil. Um, so actually what we, what we want is a, a better dissolution so the, the lime uh, moves down. I'm, I'm jumping ahead now, but if anybody knows what, what you would apply under these circumstances. Gypsum. Gypsum, yeah. Gypsum dissolves much better than lime and moves down further. In these very acid soils, what roots experience, the problem that they experience is very often lack of calcium for the root tips to function properly and to be resistant against the very uh, high aluminum concentrations that cause the problem. Um, so the, the, the gypsum moves down more quickly, um, which doesn't mean it, it's going down very far, but the effect can then go down maybe to 30 or 40 centimeters within a year or two. Yeah. That's jumping ahead a little bit, but um, here you see only variable charge in soil organic matter. Um, and luckily, the point of zero net charge of organic matter is very low. So it's below, it's, it's below the, the, the pH of, uh, of soils, usually. So we have always a net negative charge, means net cation exchange capacity for organic matter. No matter how low we, we drive our... Um, our soil pH. So that's great because adding soil organic matter always means we add cation exchange capacity. We retain our nutrients better. So that's, that's very important. And different uh, groups in the soil organic matter have, um, have different ability to contribute to that uh, at different pH ranges, um, but we don't need to spend much time on that. Uh, just a remark that also roots can absorb nutrients, so the root surfaces themselves are not taking only up, but they also um, are uh, acting as absorbers for nutrients. Now, a little bit the distribution of charges and the mechanism and, and some models how that works. Um, but I, bother, I, I won't bother you too much with that. I leave that for a colleague of mine, uh, Murray McBride, who's giving a, an excellent class, a 600-level class on soil chemistry, where he will, he will um, uh, discuss that at great length, um, how adsorption actually works. So you have the adsorber with negative charge, uh, let's say our smectite, who has a net, uh, has a net um, negative charge on the surface, and then yet you have our cations that absorb to that. And what happens is that a lot of cations, of course, like to be very, very close to that surface. And they try to occupy as much space as possible on the surface of the uh, adsorber. As we move away from the uh, adsorber, the concentration of the cations will become smaller and smaller and smaller, and the concentration of the negative charges becomes higher and higher until we reach an equilibrium where the same amount of positive and negative charges uh, prevail. This first layer we call after a guy named Stern, so that's where only positive charges uh, are present. Uh, so that's, and the thickness of this Stern layer tells us something about the absorbing complex and the, uh, and the properties, but we don't go into that into detail. Uh, then there's something that they call a diffuse layer, where still more positive than negative charges are present, but it's going rapidly down. And then there's the equilibrium soil solution where there's as many positive charges as negative charges. So, so that's, that's a way of, of handling that. And actually, well, you can also depict it in this. So at the beginning here, uh, very, very close to the uh, surface of the mineral, you have uh, the same concentration um, of cations with, with distance. Um, you have no anions really, um, and then the cations concentration goes down, the anion concentration goes up until both have the same. And the thickness of the stern layer, the thickness of the diffuse layer, they are important parameters for understanding what's happening with the absorbing complex. 
and they are very important also for uh, understanding soil stability, for instance. Um, if they are very wide, you can understand that other minerals cannot move closer together. Uh, if they're very small, then they can move closer together. Uh, that will depend on the concentration in the equilibrium solution and so on and so on. Um, but we won't go into gr great detail into that. What interests us more is um, to compare different uh, elements. So what we did in the last step was we compared different clay minerals and found out that they were very different, but now we do the next step, we also find out that the, that the different nutrients or elements in, in the soil have different affinity to um, the, the clay mineral surface. And here I depicted aluminum higher than calcium, higher than magnesium, uh, more affinity than potassium, uh, and uh, ammonium, more affinity than uh, sodium. Any idea why they're in this, in this uh, Order, yeah, charge. Peter. Charge. So, who has more charge? <coughs> Aluminum has more charge than calcium. Calcium has more charge than magnesium. Yeah. They have equal. So, yeah, but you're right. There, there is an order. The more the more charges on the left here, and they have apparently, according to this here, more affinity to the clay mineral surface than sodium, and and it's sort of a charge range. That's correct. But why why did I paint here the the this sign between calcium and magnesium, if they have both the same charge, they're both plus two. Yeah, Joseph. Iron radius. That's a good, uh, good suggestion. Why iron radius? So apparently, calcium is larger than than magnesium. Uh, how? What, what's the mechanism? Yeah, that sounds good. So the smaller a, the smaller it would be, the 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 better it can absorb somewhere, because then it can move closer to it, and that that is energetically um, conducive. However, magnesium is smaller than calcium, so that that's odd. When I mean, you're still right, but one step is missing. You're right that if that nutrient can move closer to the absorbing surface, it would absorb more heavily. But following that rationale, magnesium should be absorbed more vigorously than calcium. So what is missing in that? It's, it's, it's hard for you to know, but it's actually the magnesium is larger with its hydration layer. Because it is smaller, because magnesium is smaller, it attracts more protons. Uh, it attracts more, more uh, um, yeah, protons in water, the dipoles of water. So it has a, a larger hydration layer around it than calcium, which is a, a bigger iron. So including its hydration layer, the magnesium is actually larger than the calcium. So it's, it's turning the original categories of small and large exactly on top. Yes, magnesium is smaller than calcium. Calcium is bigger than magnesium. But including its hydration, it is actually the opposite. Magnesium is larger than calcium. And the rationale is exactly the same. Magnesium is smaller, therefore it attracts more water around it. Calcium is bigger, that's, therefore it attracts fewer water molecules around it. So that means that with its hydration layer, magnesium is actually larger than calcium. And that is why calcium is more heavily bonded or uh, more attracted to the negative charges of the, of the clay minerals.
and sometimes I put these things, they were once, they were not upside down um, uh, on there because these things mean, yes, play attention and this is very important and I'm probably going to ask it at some point. Um, th this is very important. Uh, anybody who hasn't understood that completely, shall we, shall we look at that again? Yeah. So I don't understand if, if the magnesium <coughs> attracts um, negative ions from water, is that correct? That the hydration shell? Is yeah. Mm -hmm. So how does it still have like a net charge to attach to the, or to absorb, absorb to the, like the exchange side? Yeah, you could you could argue that that it completely satisfies its uh, its need for for negative charges around it. Um, but since the water the the deep hole, it, it's not really an an an, uh, an anion. The water, it's just a very weak deep hole. So whatever hangs on there is 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 not so much that it would hinder it to look for another better negative charge. It's not an ionic bonding. No, okay. no, it's just a deep hole bondage, a very weak. Uh, deep hole bondage, um, yeah, for water. Because water, as you probably know, the, the oxygen among the H2, it's not a flat thing, um, but it's in an, an angle, uh, so that on the oxygen side, um, you, you, have the, you have some, the, the oxygen pulling more of the electrons over um, than the hydrogen can hold it. So you have a, what's called a deep hole. Um, on one end of the, on, of the water, you have a a weak negative charge and on the other one a weak positive charge. But, but the differences are very, very small um, and that doesn't seem to have um, a totally prohibitive effect on the magnesium to seek a negative surface charge somewhere. But that's a good question, yeah. Um, now we're looking for some ways to characterize this electrostatic adsorption. And that is what we call a cation exchange capacity. So it is, again, like we, we very often discover uh, in the lab, um, these are operationally defined parameters that help us understand what's happening in soil. Um, so this, what we call cation exchange capacity, a measurement for um, the ability of the soil to retain cations, is a very, very important <coughs> parameter for a range of processes that we might be interested in. First of all, that's what we probably at the moment are very much interested in. It's, uh, it's a good parameter to estimate uh, the storage of nutrients in plant available form. So if you have a high cation exchange capacity, then you probably, the soil has a lot of possibilities to retain cations, which in turn are then available for plants. So um, that, that helps us understanding plant availability of nutrients. Uh, it's a measurement of how well the soil can protect and retain nutrients against leaching losses, uh, buffering of proton input and acidity, um, for instance, acid rain uh, is, a, is a prime example, buffering of pollutants, organic metals, for instance, uh, stabilization of, of soil structure um, with a high calcium saturation. Uh, we have probably a better uh, soil structure uh, why is that? What, what, what would be a soil uh, covered, exchange site covered with uh, and has a, has a weak soil structure? With calcium, since it is a divalent cation, calcium is 2 plus, it has sort of two arms to grab a, a clay mineral here and a clay mineral here, there, and it holds it. So it really holds the, the clay mineral structure nicely in place and promotes good aggregation. Whereas what is another cation that, that can be in soil? For instance, these days outside, if you look um, now that it's thawing the last few days, uh, roadside, um, you have a lot of puddling always. And that's not always due to compaction, but what, what's in the, the soils very often? Sodium. sodium, yeah. And sodium has only one arm. It is only one, it's a monovalent cation. So it can't hold the, it doesn't really promote soil stability very much. In fact, it deteriorates soil structure because it holds only one, with one arm it holds the, uh, the, the clay minerals and 
everything gets puddled and muddled and, and uh, the, the soil structure falls apart. So also there we're very much interested in, in under, uh, knowing that, for instance. Um, it's an indicator for pathogenic processes and therefore it found entry in classification systems. So all classification systems that you might think of have somewhere a parameter very, very in the beginning on your decision tree. Um, do you have a cation exchange capacity higher than X or lower than X? And higher than X, it's this category. Lower than X, it's that category. So it's a very important classification mechanism and not for convenience sake because it really is an ecological important indicator. Um, and it's an indicator for uh, sedimentation processes and it's used also in other uh, scientific areas. Um, and this cation exchange capacity is defined by the measurement of the amount of positive charge which can be bound by a given soil. Um, so what we do is uh, we, we measure this uh, amount of positive charge that is, um, that is uh, attracted by the soil and, and exchanged by the soil. And we have two different terms and two different possibilities how we measure that. One is the effective cation ex exchange capacity that we might be interested in, and one is the potential cation exchange capacity that we might be interested in. And both of them we will learn in, in uh, uh, experiment five that uh, Joseph will, will teach you on. So you will have hands-on experience how these are actually measured and how that works in the lab. And that will help you um, uh, re rework that thinking process. So if, what, what is the basic difference here? Effective is measured at the natural pH of the soil. So it's the cation exchange capacity. If the soil has a pH of four, we measure the amount of positive charges that are adsorbed to surfaces at pH of 4. So at the pH of, of the soil, we are interested in the amount of cations held by the soil. And what are cations? For instance, calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, uh, protons, aluminum. Uh, in some soils, we have to consider also some of the micronutrients. Very often, they're not considered because the amounts compared to the other nutrients is so, so low that we can very often forget about it. Um, actually, Protons and aluminum are often not determined directly uh, by ICP or pH measurements, but something called as exchangeable acidity by titration mechanisms. And that's exactly what group five does. Um, so that is, that is the amount of cations adsorbed at the pH of the soil. And then we have something that's called a potential cation exchange capacity, where we look at the amount of cations adsorbed at a standard pH, and the standard pH is chosen to be 7. Uh, that is a convention. Um, some change that a little bit, but um, um, it, it, in, the major, um, in the major reference books now, pH 7 and a specific method for that uh, has been proposed. Um, now, there, there are a couple of questions that we need to uh, talk about with respect to that. Uh, why, why pH of 7? and why potential? And why bother about a standard pH anyways? Any ideas on that? Why not suffice, well, why does the first effective cation exchange, exchange capacity not suffice any, any wishes that you might have um, on these measurements? Or sometimes not? Yeah, Tara. Exactly. So if you have both, if you have effective and potential, you can actually estimate what happens if you would increase the pH. And if you have only permanent charge, nothing happens. If you have a lot of variable charge, a lot happens. So you're actually interested maybe in both. You might be interested what happens if you increase the pH with your CC. That might be very interesting. What is another objective here that you might have? Why would you be interested? Think about, for instance, if you compare two different soils. Or think about if you have a soil and you want to compare a treatment with manure and without manure. 
what happens if you only analyze the effective cation exchange capacity? Krista, do you want to think out loud? So what, what happens if you, if you compare two different soils, one from the tropics down in Brazil and one here from, uh, from a lime soil? Yeah, on the right track, yes. So CEC decreases with the pH, and um, so if you need to know the, how. <laughs> yeah, so if, if these two soils have a different pH, if, if for instance, the, the soil in the Amazon has a pH of 4, and the soils down here have a pH of 7 or 6, you don't know whether the difference in cation exchange capacity is actually due to the pH or due to that there is more exchange site potentially available. So you don't know that. And now the other example, what happens if you have soil with pH of 5 and you, you manure it and you want to know something about the changes of cation exchange capacity of the manured and non-manured soil? What, what can happen when you manure the soil? Peter. Mm -hmm. Possible, yeah. Yeah, very good idea, yeah. So any amendment, you can probably not affect only the amount of charges or uh, potential exchange sites, but also the pH. It could go down, it could go up. Sometimes these manures are, are some uh, have high pH, they increase the pH, but, but sometimes you're right, they can decrease the pH. And that's exactly what we learn also with, with uh, uh, group five, that um, we, we don't really know. If we have the objective to retain more nutrients, but at the same time we decrease the, or change the pH, we don't really know what we did with our soil. So um, by controlling for the pH, we have a better handle on what actually happened with our management or comparison between two different soils. Or, as a projection, what would happen if we would lime, as Tara mentioned. Uh, potential, it's called, because probably 7 is the most you would ever do with a soil. I mean, you wouldn't lime to a pH of 9. You can't even do it because the pKa is not 9 for calcium carbonate. But um, you, uh, you would probably uh, be, be very happy with a pH of of seven with your soil. So it's sort of the upper end of that. Then there's a, a parameter called that base saturation. And that is uh, an interesting parameter because um, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium um, are uh, indicators of, um, of uh, soil nutrient availability. And if you divide the or express the amount of calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium in the soil, as uh, a percentage of total cation exchange capacity, that gives you an indication of uh, soil properties. In very low pH soils, this percentage goes down. In high pH soils, this percentage goes up. Um, and a lot of classification uh, um, systems use cutoffs of 50% and say lower than 50% is really an acid soil, low fertility above 50% base saturation is a good soil, uh, very well equipped with, with cations. So th this is a, a useful um, parameter. Um, and this can be calculated both from the potential and effective CC, um, though it's, uh, but it's usually done with uh, effective CC um, and doesn't really make much sense um, for, the, for the potential CC. Actually, I wrote here also basis is a wrong expression because we, we might confuse that or think that uh, when they are present that th these are acting as uh, ensuring a high pH, but uh, this is just a nomenclature uh, issue. Um, and now I want to, to discuss in the, the rest of the time the, uh, the calculation exercise that I ask you to do um, and uh, think through this uh, when you have analysis for calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium and the soil acidity how you can calculate first the cation exchange capacity and the, the base saturation 
um, from that. And I gave you the, the background information for the atomic masses. Um, if we take uh, two minutes that you in groups exchange your results and discuss briefly what you found, um, and then we'll discuss in the plenary uh, what, you, what you found out. Um, uh, and uh, so what's, what's the task here? What, what is cation exchange capacity? How, how, do you, how do you calculate cation exchange capacity from these values? So I gave you a mass of calcium per unit mass of soil. And I gave you the acidity already in charges per mass of soil. How can you calculate cation exchange capacity first, which we need before we even can calculate base saturation. Yeah, Peter. The equivalent weight, yeah. Okay, and how, so you need to, where do you want to end up? Um, Mm -hmm. And then what do you want to do? Uh, the, the, what is the cation exchange? Okay, and the CC is the sum of all charges. So since I, since I didn't give you charges but weights, you need to convert the weights into charges. And you need the equivalent uh, uh, relationship between weight and charge for each of the atoms. And I gave that, that's the atomic mass that you need for that, but you need to be aware of one thing, um, that there are divalent and monovalent cations. Um, so if we, if we look at that uh, here, so what, what we need to do is we need to first, for each of the nutrients, we need to convert the mass of the nutrient per unit mass of the, um, of the soil to uh, moles per mass of soil and we have the equivalent atomic mass here um, and then we need to consider that they have different charges that calcium has two charges uh, and potassium and sodium have only one charge so we need to multiply this by two for magnesium and calcium whereas for potassium and sodium we only multiply by one and then we get the amount of positive charges of calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium in the soil. And that can be sometimes confusing. There are different units around. Either it's millimole with a little c or with a little plus per kilogram. You can also see millimole per hundred grams. You can see milli equivalent. Um, so you see a lot of different ones. So you need to convert them into each other um, if appropriate. So then the cation exchange capacity is the sum of all the cations plus the acidity as described two slides earlier. So you sum up all the, the charges of the cations plus the acidity, which I gave you already in millimoles charge per kilogram, so you don't need to do anything else. Uh, summing all that up gives 100 and summing all bases up gives 95 and 95 divided by 100 is then base saturation of 95%. Can we go through this, despite that we are already three minutes over time? Just somebody else explain it quickly in, in, in one minute with his own words or her own words. Angela, do you want to you wanna try quickly? Yeah. Yes. We add all the charges and we have to use the, yeah, the acidity also, we add that in. Yeah. Divide the number, the amount of bases compared to the acidity over total. Okay. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much.